Our boys are five years old and almost four years old, so they are pretty close. Uh, Drew was the Lord's plan, not ours. And so uh, when you're 16 months apart, that was a, a great blessing that we could not have planned for. And so I tell you that because of the way that we kind of have our connect classes set up. We have a nursery age, and then we have a three through five-year-old class. And so when we first came here three years ago, both David and Drew were in the nursery together. But at some point along that way, when David turned three, he graduated up to the three to five-year-old class. And for the last probably year and a half, Drew had remained back in the nursery. Well, a few weeks ago, we had promotion Sunday, and Drew now graduated up to be with his brother in the three to five-year-old class. And so I was told a story that they were learning a lesson about King David while Drew and David were in the class just a few weeks ago. Miss Miko was teaching, and Drew's listening to the lesson about King David and King David and King David. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, he stops and he says, hey, pointing to his brother, David, and he says, he's not a king. <laughs> I was like, you are right, buddy. You are right. And as I think about that story, I am reminded that if we're not careful, something could be partially true. So King David, his name is David. Um, our son is clearly not a king. He thinks he's a king, but he's not a king. But if you don't have somebody call out something that's not all the way true, we might start to believe it. There are many phrases and sayings in culture nowadays that people have just come to accept as true, that maybe are partially true, or as a matter of fact, some of them are entirely false, but for some reason, none of us or people have not cared enough to speak into that and say, hey, that's not entirely true. And so for that reason, today we're kicking off a brand new teaching series called Say What? Y'all say, say what? And we are going to be examining some common cliches each week that I think many of us have either heard, perhaps sometimes we may say or use, and then we're going to be looking at what the Bible actually says about those sayings. And, and today I want to talk to you about this phrase, follow your heart. You've probably all heard that before, maybe you've heard other people say it, and unfortunately the reality is it's not a biblical teaching. And the reason why so many people don't actually, actually follow what the Bible says is because we live in a world that doesn't really live with a biblical worldview anymore. As a matter of fact, Barna did a study recently, and they examined 2,033 adults, and it showed that only 4% of those adults that they surveyed have a biblical worldview as the basis of their decision-making. So, so like that's the lens through which those adults make their decisions. Now, the question I asked when I saw that study is, well, if they're not using the Bible for their decisions, then what are people using? Well, I think many people would say they use their intellect, but I think also just as many people use their feelings, a.k.a. their heart. That's why so many people follow their heart. And so that's why I want to speak into that phrase today. And the problem with that phrase is it doesn't take very long looking at scripture to see how that phrase is flawed. As a matter of fact, the prophet Jeremiah spoke to it hundreds of years before Jesus came. He says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is, what does that word say? Deceitful above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? So what does that mean? Well, that means that we are all born into sin, that we don't have to be taught how to sin. And I always like to use toddlers, and I wanna use my son Drew as actually a better example because Drew is actually much more sweet-natured than our son David is. But even Drew has gotten to the age now where like, if, if we say, Drew, don't touch this podium, he'll look at me and he'll go, and I'm like, dude, you better not touch it. Like, he, knows how to, he knows how to do what's wrong, but rather has to be taught how to do what's right. And it's because we all have that sin tendency. Romans 5 talks about it. It's, it's because that in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, it says in Romans 5, 12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, and Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. What does that mean? That means that when Adam sinned, it came into the world, and so now we are inherently born into this sin. So our hearts are naturally deceitful. 
even when we come to know Jesus, how many of you know that just because we come to know Jesus doesn't mean we immediately stop sinning? Hopefully we sin less often, but we will never become sinless until we get to heaven one day, amen? That, that as we grow to follow Jesus, we still are going to have sin struggles. So that is why it's so important to use God's word as the lens for our decision making. Because feelings, they'll change, they'll come and go, but God's word is unchanging. So if we wanna know what God's will for our life is, God's will won't contradict God's word. If you wanna know what God's will for your life is, God's will can be found in his word. And so if we're not to follow our heart, and we are, I would tell you today, the title of the message is Don't Follow Your Heart, Follow Jesus. So if we wanna follow Jesus, how do we do that? Well, Matthew 16 is where I wanna direct your attention today. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to go ahead and turn there. And I wanna look at just one verse at first, and then we're gonna look at a, at a few other verses right around this. And in verse 24, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. So it means we don't follow our heart, we follow Jesus. Well, then as I see that, my question I grapple with is how exactly do we do that? Well, I wanna pull out three truths from this passage today. We're gonna look at verse 21 through 26. And I wanna just share with you those three insights that, that I uh, learned as I read and studied this week. And before we do, we always start with kind of like a main point or a main idea. If you got a bulletin, we have these things called uh, listener guides that we put in there. It's a, hopefully a helpful tool for you to take notes. If you're not a note taker, uh, I would still encourage you to go ahead and write this down. So the main point or the main idea for today is this. Don't follow your heart, follow Jesus. Y'all say follow Jesus. Following Jesus may sometimes conflict with our feelings, but true faith means trusting in Jesus more than we trust our feelings. So my question then to you today is how do we do that? What does that practically look like? Well, Jesus is gonna show us in this interaction with his disciples, and I wanna give you a little bit of context. So Jesus, just before these verses we're about to look at, he gathers his disciples around, and he says, hey, um, I got some bad news. I'm gonna die. Like, I'm, I'm gonna die, and Peter, I would like to believe it's from a good heart, but he has a response here, and the first thing we're gonna see from, from Peter's response, the first way we can follow Jesus and not our heart is that we've gotta pursue God's perspective not our own. We've gotta pursue God's perspective, not our own. That comes from verse 22 and 23. So Jesus says, hey guys, I'm gonna die, and look at how Peter responds. It says, Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him. Can you imagine reprimanding Jesus? Now again, they're still trying to, you know, they, they know and believe that he's the Messiah, but he took Jesus aside, he's like, hey Jesus, come on, let me, let me tell you something here. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Then Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. Strong response, right? And then he says, you're a dangerous trap to me. But what stood out to me was this last part. He says, you are seeing things from merely a human point of view, not from God's. Now, when I read that, I am reminded of how many times in my life, and I'm sure in your life, where we can struggle with seeing beyond our own perspective, right? That so many times all we can see is what is right in front of us. And I find that many times my perspective will clash with God's plans. Anybody else been there before, right? That I, I have a way, like I have, the, I call it playing the movie in my mind. I have a movie that's playing in my mind and God says, no, no, that's not the movie I've written. I've got a different plan for you. And so what do we do when our perspective clashes with God's Plans. Well, when our perspective clashes with God's plans, God's plans don't need to change. Our perspective needs to change. That we have to change how we look at our situation. Well, you might be asking, well, what about when something's sinful or something unjust or something that's not right? Like, what, what do I do when those things happen to me? Because that happens all the time. And I would say, yes, that is, that is sad. It's heartbreaking. That's the result of sin coming into the world. But still, God gives us the power to ask him for a different perspective. And I would encourage you in those places and those spaces to remember that we serve a sovereign God, that he has a long 
view and a long plan. That sometimes just a moment, all we can see what's happening to us in that moment, but we don't always see the long plan of God. So if we gain God's perspective, we will see his providence, his provision. I'm sure we've all been in a place where something's happened to us and we're like, why is this happening? And we get a little bit further down the road and we're like, okay, God, I get it. I understand it now. So his providence is always more powerful than our predicament. That when something happens to us, someone does something to us, they say something to us that feels unjust, unright, unfair, an illness, a family member, we don't always understand it, but we have to remember we serve a big and sovereign God. I like the way Pastor Jason Shepard says it. He says, there's no person, or you could say no event as well, on the planet that is more powerful than the long plan of God. And so Jesus is so emphatic about Peter's viewpoint on this. He says, get behind me, Satan. I'm immediately reminded of the church lady. Hmm, could it be Satan? Right, he's calling him out. He's, he's, he's speaking very directly to this. Now, does this mean that he thinks Peter is literally possessed? No, but he's making a very strong point, isn't he? He's saying that, that if we follow Jesus, we have to put aside our feelings, So following Jesus, it means putting aside what we want to ensure that God's will happens in our lives. And that's a tough thing to live out, but God's plans are better than our plans, amen? And I have found that much of life is not so much what's happening to us, but how we look at what's happening to us. You could have the same situation but a slight tweak in your perspective and it changes everything about the well-being and the welfare of your life. So I'm a big practical like so what guy. So what does this mean for our lives? Well, I wanna give you some practical ways to ask God or to pursue God's perspective. Number one, this may not seem so earth shattering, but I think all of us are guilty of not doing this and that is to ask God for it. Do we ask God, hey, I don't understand this I don't know why this is happening. I need your eyes on this situation. Do we do that? Do we ask God for his perspective? That's the most important one. The next one is perhaps in many ways just as powerful because the next one is ask others for their input. We have God places people in our life for a reason and sometimes someone can be close enough to us to, to know our situation, but also far enough removed to not be emotionally attached. I use the analogy, how many of you have typed a paper before and you're like, yep, this paper's awesome, or you typed an email, this is awesome, it's ready to go, and you ask someone to look at it and they're like, there are 18 spelling mistakes right here in this one paper. We've all been there, right? Sometimes you have to ask someone that's just outside of you to look at your situation. And then finally, this one is is also powerful, it's ask yourself questions about your situation. When Pastor Ronnie Marriott was here a while back, he talked about this specifically with stress and anxiety that we need to zoom out. And sometimes the way that we zoom out is we, say, we just ask ourselves questions. Is this temporary or is it permanent? Am I imagining this or is this reality? Is this going to forever change my life or is this just a momentary difficulty? Sometimes asking those questions can help us gain a better view on our situation. So following Jesus, it won't always change our predicament, but it can change our perspective on our predicament. I like the way Mark Batterson says it. He says, the circumstances we ask God to change are often the circumstances God is using to change us. That'll preach right there. And as he changes us, he refines our view on life. Now, I want to illustrate this, and this is going to ask for all audience participation. Before I do this, uh, how many of you know what dominant eye you are? Anybody know that? We've got a few people. So if you don't know what dominant eye you are, basically you, you make a circle like this. So everybody make a circle. If you already know your dominant eye, use the opposite hand of your dominant eye. So I am right eye dominant, and so I'm using my left hand. And so the way you find that out is we're going to use the cross because the answer for everything is Jesus, amen? So we're gonna put the cross in the middle, and the way you find out your dominant eye is that you look at an object with both eyes, and then as you close one eye, whichever 
eye that the object remains in is your dominant eye. So for me, when I close my, my left eye, my right eye, the cross stays in there, but when I close my right eye, my hand covers the cross. You following? So, so, so the illustration here is this, and this works better for me because I'm right eye dominant, but many times we are looking at life through the wrong eye. So for me, if I'm looking at my situation from a human perspective, I'm looking at it with my left eye, but all I need to do is just say, God, give me your perspective, and he gives me the right eye. Don't we all need the right eye on our situation? We all need God's perspective in our life. This happens for all of us, and believe it or not, pastors have difficult seasons too. We battle stress too. I know that in ministry that, that we are called to be filled with joy, and we are, but there are certainly seasons where they're more difficult, and if I could be honest with you for a second, their last couple weeks have been a little stressful in my life. A couple weeks ago, some of you may know this, I shared with you a few weeks ago, I didn't know if we were gonna be able to have church in this building because literally the power kept going on and off. And so that was a stressful situation. We've had some other things pop up here and there. Liz got COVID, which if you know about her health condition, she's got an immune situation. We have a newborn. And so I just found myself, if I'm honest, just really kind of overwhelmed. And I discovered a song recently that Elevation Worship had put out a few months back, and the song is called Jehovah. And that song, and we're gonna introduce it to the church in a few weeks, it talks about the power of God. It says things like, he reigns without rival. He shames every idol. His arm never tires. His eyes are like fire. And then it, it, the, the challenge of the song is to call on the name of Jehovah, the name above all names. It names specific names like Jehovah Nisi, he will fight our battles. Jehovah Rapha, he'll heal our body. Jehovah Jireh, he'll meet your need. And as I, I was literally going, driving to pick up David, and I'm not one of those like God talked to me like, like in a weird way, but I do believe that God speaks to us because he gives us his spirit, amen? And as I was driving to pick up David, I felt God's voice clearly say, Russell, I am the same God that brought dry bones to life. I am the same God that parted a Red Sea. I am the same God that Moses struck a rock and brought forth water. I am the same God that brought fire from heaven when Elijah called it down. And if I am the same God who can walk out of a grave alive, I can handle your situation. <laughs> Perspective change. Freedom. Power. We all need that but we have to ask God for it. Do we ask him for his perspective? The second thing that we see from this passage is we've gotta pursue others in God's interests more than our own. We've gotta pursue others in God's interests more than our own. Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25, it goes on to say, we already looked at this, but it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, do exactly what you want to do. You do you, boo-boo. No, it's not what it says. It says, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. He says, if you'll hang on to your life, you try to hang on to your life, you're gonna lose it, but if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So he says, give up your own way. That doesn't sound like following your heart, does it? How many of you heard the phrase, God helps those who help themselves? I feel like that kind of connects with following your heart. If you read these few verses, we know that that just cannot be true. The better way of saying that would be God helps those who die to themselves. God helps those who serve others. God helps those who get outside of themselves. And one of the things I hear most often with people who are either struggling with accepting Christianity or perhaps they are a Christian but they're struggling to reconcile parts of the Christian faith is what do we do when the Bible calls us to do something that doesn't line up with our feelings. It's a difficult thing. It happens pretty often. But here's what I think Jesus is teaching us. Trust the Bible more than we trust our feelings. Feelings can change. The Bible doesn't. 
Matter of fact, feelings will often eventually change, but God doesn't. I like the way Shane Pruitt says it. He says, when our feelings, emotions, opinions, and preferences and lifestyles don't line up with the Bible, it's not the Bible that needs to change. So my question then I ask is, how do I know? Because we know that scripture is unchanging, but there's often times in our walk with Jesus where, and if you're anything like me, I can ask the question, is this the Holy Spirit or is this my feelings? Sometimes those two things feel blurry because we feel like the Spirit's leading us to something, but I don't know if it's just because I'm feeling a certain way or if God's really calling me to do that thing. And John 16, 13 says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he's heard. So what does this mean? The Spirit will not lead us to do something that's not true. That's why it's so important to have the word, to have other people around us, because sometimes we might be feeling something, but it could have just been bad pizza that we ate. It could have just been, I really like X team, or I really like X situation, but I may not need to be doing this situation. I really feel like I should do this, but if it doesn't line up with God's word, then maybe something else is wrong about me and what I'm feeling or thinking about this situation. So I wanna give you some practical ways to know if something is of God or is of our feelings. Number one, we said it before, but to pray, to ask God, is this of you or is this just something I'm personally feeling strongly about? The second thing is read the Bible. God's will won't contradict God's word. So if you're struggling with something, it's amazing what Google has done for Bible access. Did you know that you can type into Google Bible verses about blank? And guess what it'll do? Like in an instant. It's amazing. So you can literally narrow, you don't have, I mean, yes, we wanna read the whole counsel of God's word, but we can find answers a lot faster today. And then the third thing is that wise counsel, that as you have people, if you feel something, but as you ask other people, they will speak into your life. I see this often in dating, that people will, if you've ever, if you've dated some, if you dated more than one person that you married, um, there may have been seasons where you swung and missed on a dating relationship. Maybe I'm the only one. Thank God I got it right with Liz. I married way over my head. Thank you, Jesus. But uh, you probably have known someone that has been dating someone where everyone around you is like, no, don't do it. But you're like, oh, but I, I love them or I feel strongly for them. And if everyone else around you is going, no, 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 guess what the common denominator is, right? Sometimes you have to have those people that can speak into your life. So Jesus is saying we've got to give up our own way, and if we try to hang on to our life, sometimes or we will lose it. Well, if we follow our feelings all the time, we're not going to be following what God wants and what he desires. This is true of everything in life. I'm sure if you are here today and you are working or you have worked, I, I, I can't be the only one that has ever worked in a job that said, I don't know if I really want to go to work today. But yet, how many of us know that part of it is you have to strap your bootstraps up and show up, right? Suit up and show up. That's half the battle. For me, a big thing in my life is exercising. If I only exercised when I felt like it, I would work out once or twice a year. I'm just going to be honest. About once or twice a year, I'm like, let's do this. Every other day, I'm like, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I'm going to die. I hate this. But then guess what happens after you do it? You feel good. Same thing is true in our life spiritually, that sometimes we have to go with what God says and trust that the feelings will follow sometimes later. And Jesus is saying, how do we do all this? We have to get outside of ourselves and we serve other people. If we want to know how to give up our own way and know that we're following God, we've got to serve other people. Rick Warren says it this way, whenever you serve others in any way, you are actually serving God. So serving others, it helps to ensure that we are giving up our own way while also simultaneously following God's way. And here's what happens. In a world that is so consumed with me, myself, and mine, when the world looks at us and sees as the church that we are about other people, guess what happens? We stand out in the best way. So I, I saw this fascinating um, 
scientific, I don't know what you call it, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon, if you will. How many of you have ever seen a pack of flamingos? Is it a pack, a flock, something? I don't know what they're called, but I've got a picture here of flamingos. And notice that some of them are very pink, and some of them are actually losing their pink. And I found out this week that those ones that are losing their pink are actually parents that are feeding their young. That it literally during that season will cause flamingos to be depleted of their pink. Parents are like, come on somebody, that'll preach, right? Could pray it out and go home right now. But how many of you know that when you look at that, you can immediately see the difference? It's what we're called to, church. That the world looks at us and they go, that one's serving, that one's about Jesus, that one's not about themselves, that they are getting outside of themselves. Now you might be saying, well, Pastor Russell, am I supposed to be just depleted all the time? No, because why? God has designed it in such a way that as we give out to others, guess what happens? We are refreshed. I got a text this week from somebody who showed up to serve on Surf Sunday, and they said, I, don't, I didn't know if my back was gonna be able to handle it. But then they said, I felt so rewarded and so refreshed. And it's the process, I would liken it to like breathing. If you feel really stressed, scientifically, guess what breath is the one that refreshes you? (sighs) And as we go out, we breathe out, it allows us to breathe in and be refreshed. So as we serve others, as we go out, God has a way of refreshing us. Do we put others before ourselves? And the final thing that Jesus shows us is we've gotta pursue holiness more than happiness. Verse 26 says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? I don't know about you, but I've heard people say, God just wants me to be happy. God just wants you to be happy. That God cares about our happiness more than anything else. And I'm not saying that God doesn't care about our happiness at all, but I think that's the wrong word. God cares about our joy. And how many of you know that joy doesn't always go along with our circumstances? The Apostle Paul shows us that in Philippians when he is put in prison. And in verses 11 through 13, he says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, plenty or little. And then he says the verse that we all have needle pointed everywhere, for I can do everything who get through Christ who gives me strength. Context is everything. He says, I've, I've learned that it's not about my situation. That's where my happiness is found, is from the Lord and the Lord alone. So here's what I think is a better way of saying this. God, it's not that God doesn't want us to be happy, but he cares about our holiness more than our happiness. God wants us to be holy more than he wants us to be happy. First Peter 1, says, verse 15 says, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you, who's holy. But I wanna back up a little bit because there's a problem with that. We can't be holy on our own. We can't be righteous on our own. Because the problem is that we all have a bad heart, a deceitful heart, a sinful heart. Something has to solve that situation. That's why Psalm 51.10 says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. We can't solve our situation. We can't earn our way to God. If you're here today and you're, you're thinking, maybe if I go to church more, maybe if I pray more, maybe if I give more, It's understandable because the world teaches that, but the Bible is clear that we cannot earn our own salvation. But God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for my sins and for your sins, so that by grace, through faith, if we invite him into our life to take over our life, to step into the driver's seat, the Bible says we will be given a new heart. And I love the way Romans 10, 9 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done that today? Maybe some of you are here and you know that you 
haven't done that, in just a few minutes, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. But if you are here and you've done that, I want to challenge you to make sure that we are giving everything about our lives to him. I'll close with this illustration. Got a basketball here. All right, thanks, rocket scientist. This basketball is probably only worth $15 maybe, I don't know, $10. It's worth even less in my hands. My basketball career looked a lot like this. Go team, go team, go team. So this basketball is not very valuable in my hands. But imagine if I gave it to the goat, Michael Jordan. Yes, I said Michael Jordan, not LeBron James. Young people, see me after class. We will have it. These are not called LeBrons. These are called Jordan somebody for a reason. But if I gave that ball to Michael Jordan, a lot more valuable, isn't it? Same thing true as of our heart and our life. That it's not until we say, Lord, my life is yours. My heart is yours. And I think many of us here today have probably made that decision to say, yes, my eternity is yours, but I know all of us have something in our life that we've said, this is mine. This is mine. God, you can have everything else, but this part is mine. And I want to leave you with this reality, that if we want to follow Jesus and not our heart, we have to say, Lord, everything is yours. What is that area in your life that you've been holding back? The only way to ensure we are truly following Jesus with our whole hearts and our whole lives is saying, Lord, I'm going to give you my whole life today. Let us be people that do that and watch how God looks and works through our lives as the world looks at us and sees something different in us. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching the YouTube channel for Canyon Church. We pray that the message you just watched helps you to know Jesus, grow like him, and go make him known. And if you made a decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, we want to walk beside you and support you in your next steps. If you'll text the word DECIDE to the number that you see on your screen, someone from our team will reach out to you and help you in the days to come. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you just watched, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast, is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. And if you want to support the work that God's doing in and through this ministry financially, you can go to www.thecanyonchurch.org and click on the button that says Give. We pray that you have an amazing week, and we believe all of God's best is still in store for your life. We'll see you soon.